Induction. The Agency Files. A prequel. Written by Shatona Havig. Narrated by Krista Del Sorbo. Chapter 16. Steelville, July 12, 2012. 6.42 p.m. Granger advanced, his intent clear. Hani's throat went dry even as she fumbled for anything she could grab to defend herself. The chair closest to her wasn't much of an option, but she held it up in front of her. Granger laughed, a diabolical sound if she'd ever heard one. You think that flimsy thing with its wide open slats will protect you? Hani swallowed hard. She had to find a way to get control of the situation, and now... Before she could respond, Keith bolted out the back door and straight toward Granger. She opened her mouth to call out a warning and changed her mind. Sure enough, Granger turned his attention to Keith and went on the offensive. Keith never had a chance. Sweet tea left the pitcher in a graceful arc, and Keith plowed right into the path. And that's where Granger made his mistake. He forgot to step aside. Keith's momentum wasn't the slightest bit arrested by a blast of cold, sticky leaf water, and down they both went. Ouch! Twice in one night? I'm sore enough as it is. You'll hurt tomorrow. Hani didn't even try to temper her glee. Granger once again was on his feet, offering assistance after a tackle. Good thing I played football in high school. Bad thing I didn't dodge. He shot Keith a confused and somewhat annoyed look. What was that for? Hani screamed. I came out and she's using a chair for protection. What did you expect? Keith pulled his tea-soaked shirt away from his body at the same time a drop fell from his hair to his nose. Any ideas of not laughing, which she'd never entertained anyway, dissolved. A chuckle became a chortle, which rapidly evolved into laughter and culminated, much to her mortification, in a series of guffaws. One moment she stood there wheezing, tears streaming down her cheeks as she let loose the tension of the assignment in the ridiculousness of the day's events, and the next she sat on the grass and let it go. Only seconds later, she found herself jerked up from the grass and pushed onto the deck. Do you want to itch for the next week? Seriously? Behind him, the evening sky turned purple, fuchsia and coral. Hani tore her gaze from the living oil painting and back to Granger's scowling face. Huh? The scowl disappeared and the smile she'd begun to associate with him formed. Ah, thought you were from Cincy. So? So anyone with any brains, and I'm sure you've got a few, knows to stay out of the grass during summer, so... So, she was an idiot. That so. Ugh, I know better. What was I thinking? Hani thought fast. She flashed him a grin and folded her arms over her chest before laughing at him again. Oh, right. I was thinking how ridiculous you guys looked colliding in a spray of sweet tea. I have a bottle in my truck if you want to join us. He swatted at his neck. Then again, I wouldn't wish the mosquitoes on anyone even someone who disses the Razorbacks. She couldn't resist. Come on, woo pig suey, really? Don't diss the backs or I'll reconsider the bloodletting by Skeeters. You won't win this one, honey. Keith appeared and went straight for the grill. Razorback fans are as loyal as Bama any day. You did not just intimate that I care anything about football, much less make me but the look on Granger's face was too good to pass up. She cocked her head, planted hands on hips, and jutted out her chin. Roll tied. Them's fighting words. Losing ones for you. Two could play at the drop the G game. We beat you. Keith snickered at that one. When Granger looked over at him, Keith snickered again. Come on, when was it? Two thousand? Two thousand six, but who's counting? You must do the G thing when you want to be taken seriously. Or maybe when you're nervous. She hadn't noticed it before, anyway. She'd work out why she cared later. While Keith went back to getting the grill going to make the perfect burger, 
Hani beckoned Granger to follow her. Come on, Hog. Let's get you washed up before the winged vampires turn you into one of them. The guy actually stuck his arms out like a bird, made buzzing sounds, and headed right for her. She should have stood her ground, but instead she squealed and dashed for the back door. It slammed into his face with a satisfying rattle, but she couldn't get the deadbolt turned before he twisted the knob and pushed her back. Count Dracula would turn in his coffin if he heard the southern twang attached to the mock Transylvanian accent the guy affected as he said, I'm going to drink your blood. That's gross. Granger nodded. It really is. How did it ever become a popular genre, anyway? Some things I don't want to know, Hani offered him the sink. Want a clean shirt? Keith probably has something that'd work. He started to refuse, but as he turned on the sprayer, it splashed back at him, soaking what few spots on his shirt hadn't gotten wet. Uh, I think that's a definite yes, please. Keith's open duffel bag showed a few t-shirts. Hani started to grab the top two and stopped. A quick flip showed only a USMC. The rest were plain. With that in one hand and a solid black in the other, she met Granger in the hallway. Here, I'll take this one to Keith. The guy didn't move, and Hani silently thanked Mark for rejecting Germ's recommendation to consider biosensors for all agents. The way her heart raced sent her mind spinning. That was something they'd have noticed and checked on. No biosensors, period. She gazed up at the guy's eyes and swallowed hard. How had she missed the deep blue that also managed to be bright at the same time? There, in the dim hallway, she could see them clearly, and they ramped up her heart's workout. It's just basic attraction to a good-looking guy. Nothing to see here. Half that smile formed. It did that slight hesitation thing and then evened out, little crinkles appearing around his eyes. Um, mind if I change in there? He pointed to the bathroom door, which she effectively blocked. Sure. He waited. So did she. Forget her heart. Did heart workouts give it jelly legs like squats did? Her lungs protested now. Breathing became something that required thought. Slow motion never moved so slowly. Hani's breath hitched as Granger's hand rose and rested on her shoulder. He wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. She couldn't let him, but... All need to figure out a way to get out of a much-wanted... What? You just met him, idiot. Kiss dissolved as he rotated their positions and disappeared into the bathroom. Hani felt as if he winked at her as the door closed. Except he didn't. And she'd have to deal with whatever that meant as well as get an exterminator out for the wigglers that had taken up residence in her belly. Keith appeared. Need a shirt. Hani whirled to face him, thrust the shirt at him, and hurried into the kitchen to clean up spattered water. And her reactions. Definitely needed a clean-up on reaction aisle four. Rockland, July 16th, 2012, 8.16 a.m. The moment the chief of Fairbury police disconnected, Germ burst into Mark's office. Corey, Anthony, and Karen clustered about the seating area, relaxing and strategizing. Germ still didn't know how these two things worked together. Before he could say a word, Anthony was on his feet. Got a call from Chief Varney in Fairbury. A woman called. They're tracking her down now, but the gist is, she's concerned for Lauren Humboldt, and she thinks they may be moving in underage women. Varney doesn't know if the woman was one of the escorts or one of the servers. He just couldn't tell. Call came from Marcello's. The steel in Mark's tone was the only thing that gave away his opinion on the matter. Corey, head over to Lauren's house. We'll update you on what to do before you arrive. He beckoned Germ closer. What is the concern for Lauren? She said the bosses are upset that she's not there. She thinks they'll force Lauren back. We have to find out if this caller is restaurant or syndicate. Now. Germ would have bolted out to call back and get any recordings of the call, 
but Mark continued, Get on your game and be ready to convince Lauren to leave with Corey. I don't want an IE if I can avoid it. Involuntary extraction. Lauren wouldn't like that. Not one bit. Gotcha. I think I can work this. If you get her before you get the call info from Varney, call me in. I'll deal with the chief. This he could do. His skill set might not include taking down intruders or evading assassins, but without him, the others couldn't do those things. Not that he reminded himself of that fact every day of his life, at least twice. The audio had already been uploaded to a secure server before Germ got the chief on the phone. One of his officers had verified the voice as Abby Turner, a food runner. Abby and Lauren were supposedly friends, or at least friendly. That would work out. It had to work. Lauren would be seriously ticked off if they just took her, but Mark would insist if he thought her life was in danger. Karen stepped into the office and smiled at him. Never get hurt. We couldn't function without you. Leave it to Karen to make sure he felt appreciated. Someday the world would equate the name Karen with love and encouragement. He knew it. Today he'd just say thanks. Headed out to try to lure someone at the restaurant into giving something away. Got a dress I can borrow? Germ told her to dig it out from the closet in the conference room. It's next to my manicure set. He held up his hands for inspection. You know, in case I ever decide to explore my inner nail artist's side. Ugh. Karen looked at her own plain nails and sighed. I don't suppose you actually know how to use this thing? Shaking his head, Germ recommended that she stop at the nail salon just before the loop on-ramp at Westward. They accept walk-ins and will get you in and out in under 30 minutes, or so my neighbor claims. And there goes my suspicions that I should take that naval artistry bit more seriously. But I can't spend half an hour. He broke in. From what I gather, these women are polished to the hilt. You can't afford not to. Just get a quick, simple manicure, nothing fancy, and get out of there. He swallowed hard at the look she gave him. That's my opinion anyway. No... Her look turned into something less menacing and more thoughtful. I think you're right. Good call. Karen would have left the office, but Germ called her back. Um, the dress? You need the dress. That tripped her up. How do I know it'll fit? It's one of those tuby things. It'd fit my mom or my 12-year-old cousin. He gave her a grin. And my mom is what Dad likes to call comfy-shaped. While he waited for some sign of Lauren on the Warcraft site, Germ considered other options. Perhaps he should call or email once Corey notified him of her arrival. Maybe if he demonstrated that if he could find her, anyone could. Appeal to her concern for others? He went back through all their chats and finally decided that he needed to talk to her over the phone. Mentioning Abby would help especially if he pointed out that they'd sent someone to take care of Abby, too. Another call from Chief Varney came through. Germ scribbled a note and raced into Mark's office and slapped it on the desk before dashing back. Now that he'd pinged her, he needed to be there if Lauren signed into her account. A glance at her data info showed her working, but some people kept a chat going while they worked. Knew you'd have integrity. The sound of the shredder alerted him to the open office door. Germ asked without looking up. Solari? That's just it. We got Simmons in with Solari's guy. Solari has the info about the Brunswick house. No move that way from anyone. If Solari were behind it, he'd have sent someone out. What if Leon goes later? Mark leaned against the door jam. Tells me he's on his own. I'm tempted to talk to Solari myself. He likes to eat at the Oaks. Germ watched the data numbers changing on Lauren's account and smiled. Get me a reservation for every night this week. It's time to find out his stake in this game. Mark made a point of looking at his watch. Corey should be arriving soon. I'd give her another ten minutes, unless she risked getting pulled over. Germ couldn't help but ask. So, going to put the fear of God in Solari? Nah, 
going to see if he knows a good escort service. I'm tired of women thinking that they own me after a night together. It took three looks, a couple of blinks, and even more reminders that what Mark did in his private life was none of his business before he got it. Whoa, good one. I bought it. Good, because if Solari doesn't, I could end up dead on the steps of the Oaks before the valet can even get to my car. Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.